episode 235 of, of the, the Horror, Horror Guys. Guys. I'm Kevin. I'm Brian. And we're going to talk about some horror movies. Really? We saw some horror movies this week. How many? We saw six full-length movies and a short. We did. Yeah. We're going to talk about four of the full-length movies and a short here. And two of them are in our bonus area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are we talking about today? Well, we had some Swiss exploitation with 2023's brand new film, Mad Heidi. It's a very cheesy movie. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and then we'll go back in time and watch both of the Warlock movies. Both the good Warlock movies. Yeah, there was a third some one. Some say there was a third one, but I pretend there some, was not. Some say, yeah, because Julian Sand was not in the third one. And uh, yeah, um, these are from 1989 and 1993, Warlock 1 and Warlock 2, The Armageddon. I saw both of those in the theater. I just saw the first one. Yeah, saw the second one later. And uh, then we'll visit the little girl who lives down the lane from way back in 1976. I did not see that one in the theater. I did not either. No, I don't think so. I might have. I might have. Now that <laughs> you've seen about, a lot of weird stuff when you were, but I don't two recall. Two years old. Yeah, yeah. And then as the bonus films, there's the Devil Bat. That was a De- De- uh, Bella Lugosi film from 1940. We were flipping through Tubi yesterday looking for weird stuff, and I noticed there's a colorized version of the Devil Bat. There is, yeah. We saw the original black we and white. We didn't see that one, but it's, it's available if you don't like black and white. Yeah. And then a sci-fi heavy Time Crimes from 2007, a Spanish film. The murdering, stalking creeper from the future. Yeah. Or yeah. is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah, time travel can get complicated. It sure that can. Was, I thought that was interesting because you kind of think, oh, oh, we got this figured out. And then it adds another layer to it. <laughs> and then it adds more layers on top of that. <laughs> yeah, so it was it was a pretty clever script. It's, it's not huge budget. And, you know, the acting script is, you know, the dialogue, I mean, is okay. But the story is, yeah. Really interesting. Anyway. Was, was it dubbed, subtitled? I don't remember. Yeah, it was dubbed. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I remember the dialogue wasn't amazing. That's probably why. Yeah, the dubbing loses some, I think. But yeah. the story is really good. Yeah. All right. Now, first, oh, and a reminder, over at HorrorGuysShop.com, Horror Bulletin Monthly Magazine number 22 is out. Hot diggity. Got all the reviews from last month and tells which ones we liked best and which ones we hated the most and... It was a good month. Mm-hmm, a lot was. of good things in there. Yeah. A couple of crappers, but... <laughs> <laughs> Mostly good. Mostly good, yeah. Yeah. But if you want to... If, you, uh, if you're on the Horror Bulletin e- weekly email list, you get all that stuff in your email box anyway. But some people prefer to have it in their EPUB reader, you know, Kindle or Apple or iPad or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or some people like actually even, believe it or not, get the paperback. How quaint. Whole like shelf of them on your... Paper? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that way you can, like, I don't know, highlight the important parts or mm-hmm. tear out the pages and stick them in your refrigerator or, you know, tear out the pages and sleep with them under your pillow or, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's used up, you buy another copy. Like toilet paper. <laughs> Whoa. No. Whoa. No, don't use it as that. <laughs> okay, only in the diarist of emergencies, I suppose. <laughs> only in the diarist of emergencies. Oh, my. Oh, my. my. Trash, little toilet humor here. All right, speaking of Mad Heidi from 2023. <laughs> Which is a pretty new film, and they uh, they pop up with a message at the beginning that this was crowdsourced, the funding. Yes, it was. Yeah, so there's a special thank you there. Uh, directed by Johan Hartmann and Sandro Klopstein. Klopstein. Uh, written by Johan Hartmann and Sandro Klopstein and Gregory D. Widmer. Uh, stars Alice Lucy, Max Rudlinger, Casper Van Dien. I haven't seen him in anything in a while. And David Schofield. He's been in tons and tons and tons of stuff. It's just all low budget, mm-hmm. low budget. Which we I hate to say crap again. again. <laughs> <laughs> he works cheap, maybe? I think he probably does. Yeah. Not the story he used to be. Runtime is an hour and 32 minutes, and there's a trailer on YouTube. Yeah, watch the trailer. If it looks like it should be entertaining to you, you'll like it. Mm -hmm. If you think it looks just insanely stupid, maybe not. (laughs) (laughs) Because it is almost insanely stupid. Oh, yeah. (laughs) What happens? Well, this is over the top. It takes loads of tropes and kind of dials them up to 11. And it is funny all the way through, very violent, and very well made. And we thought it was pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. Got the trailer for this, and Kevin says... Meh, don't look like much. Well, because it was so stupid looking. and then, <laughs> But then once I got into it, I was like, oh, yeah, I embraced the stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
embrace the stupid. <laughs> uh huh. All right. Well, we start off in Switzerland. You know that place with the mountains mm -hmm. and the and sheep cheese. and the goats and the cheese <laughs> and the guys with the big horns and cuckoo clocks and more cheese. All the Swiss stereotypes you can think of are, in this, are in this movie. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, Melee Cheese is being protested for their cheese monopoly. Soldiers charge in to stop the protests. Someone ch throws a cheese block at one of the soldiers, and then the shooting begins. The officer comes in with his pistol to finish off the survivors. And credits roll, as headlines report, Melee wins. And yes, he's now President Melee, who runs all of Switzerland. And he bans all the other cheeses. Cheese so, is important if you're cheese, Swiss. Cheese is important. So there's a sprinkling of of uh, Nazi spoof in here too. Yeah, all the all the soldiers are dressed like Nazis mm -hmm. yeah. instead of the little swastikas. They got the little Swiss cross, but yeah, they're Nazis. Yeah, but it's but it's funny Nazis, so they're, <laughs> so they're okay. <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with they're, funny Nazis. They're bad guys, but they're funny. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see how this goes. Well, Heidi and Goat Peter make love in the barn. Yes, his name is yes, Goat his Peter. Yes, his name is Goat Peter. His and he father raised, later he on calls goats. him Goat Peter. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> her grandfather warns her that Goat Peter is only going to break her heart. They say he's involved in some shady business. And we see that Goat Peter is an illegal cheese smuggler doing a clandestine cheese deal. He sells the good stuff. Goat cheese. And he says, happy goats make happy cheese. Why are his goats so happy? We don't know. We don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we then get an anti-lactose intolerant advertisement. Uh, the people need to be tuned in, turned in. I'm doing my part to turn in these lactose intolerants. We then cut to President Maley's office, and he's a cheese megalomaniac. We then cut to Commandant Knorr, who tortures a lactose intolerant man with boiling cheese. The man gives him the name of Goat Peter in the Alps. If his cheese is bad, don't try his chocolate. <laughs> Heidi is out in her field in the Alps doing her, what, Sound of Music dance or whatever Heidi does. You yeah, know, out Heidi, there, yeah, you know, basically. Yeah. Waving for Goat Peter, and it's all very scenic. She goes to town with him as he makes a delivery. Nor and his surprisingly Nazi-looking goons capture Goat Peter and kill him in the splatteriest, juiciest way possible. It is a very gory movie. Heidi witnesses the whole thing and rides home. Nor and his men follow Heidi home, but Grandfather takes offense. Grandfather doesn't last long, and Heidi is captured. She's taken to prison, alongside Clara, another prisoner, to meet Madame Rottweiler and Dr. Schwitzgebel a cheese researcher who weeds out those lactose intolerant traitors. And I don't know what you call that genre, but there is a, a trope of the women's prison. Yeah, women's. Yeah. Yeah. Women. The, it's definitely a women's women prison, prison movie for about movies. A half an hour. Yeah. It taps into that trope of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll stop there. Okay. So we have the women's prison for about 20, 25 minutes and then she gets out and she does her revenge thing. Yeah. And then there's revenge tropes and yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> the cheese rebels. Mm -hmm. Well, it takes all the cliches and tropes from this kind of film and blows them up tenfold. It's got everything from cuckoo clocks to Ricola commercials. Ricola. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I immediately compared it to Iron Sky in my mind. It has yeah. the same kind of humor and even a similar look. It did, yeah. And uh -huh. I liked Iron Sky a lot. Yeah, yeah. The sequel a little less, but... The original was really good. Yes, it was. There's tons of gory death and a lot of comedy gold here. Or maybe it's comedy cheese, whichever. <laughs> the fight scenes are over the top and very comic booky, and there are creature effects, believe it or not, and these are very good as well. Some of that reminded me of trauma films. You remember their yeah. some of their creature effects and yeah, you know, that the, the effects. Some of that reminded me. Of, oh, this could be a trauma film. <laughs> you know? I don't think trauma most horror. trauma films are actually this funny. This was better this than was, most trauma films. This was films. funnier, yeah. But the effects yep, made me think of it. Yeah. Anyway, it's, well, a, it's a good one. You should check, check We it like out. it, yes. It's yeah. better than cheese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Warlock from 1989, uh, which was directed by Steve Miner, written by David Twohey. 
uh, stars Julian Sands, Laurie Singer, Richard E. Grant, and Mary Maranov. Waranov. Waranov. The w. Yes. yes. It's the other M. Mm-hmm. The runtime's an hour and 43 minutes, and there's a trailer in the show notes if you've never seen that or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we heard last week that they found Julian Sands' body, finally. Yeah. Which I don't was, think was a surprise to anybody who's been following it. He's been he missing since January. Hiking and something tragic happened along the way, and yeah. They say it was natural causes or hiking injury. Nothing foul play suspected is what I heard. Yeah, yeah. some kind of hiking Whether he accident. fell or, you know, heart attack or what is unclear. I wonder if they'll ever figure but that out. Six months later, it's been they're a while. to do an autopsy. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. Well, anyway, we heard about that and decided, hey, we haven't done Warlocks. Yeah. So we should do the two Warlock movies. And that's all the horror he did, isn't it? Did uh, he do anything else? Uh, no, not that I can a think of. A lot of romantic type movies afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Lots of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I saw the first Harry Potter movie and mm-hmm. uh, Draco's father comes in. I'm like, oh, it's Julian Sands. <laughs> no, it's that other guy. It should have been. I don't. How did How did um, Jason Isaac get that role when Julian Sands was still around? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, yeah. Spoiler free? Spoiler free. What I happens? You can tell it. Well, it's an 80s romp that still holds up pretty well for entertainment value. The three main actors are excellent in their roles and they get to do a lot with them. The effects and makeup are a little hit and miss, but it's forgivable and overall still worth a watch. The effects are not CGI. I guess there's one of those things where they took like the film and painted mm-hmm. and to get kind like fireballs and stuff. Practical sort of effects. Sort of, yeah. Well, I mean, like not the CGI. pages flipping around and yeah. the flames and stuff. I don't think those were practical in any way. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they were, they were of the time, but they were good. Yeah, it gets the job done. Yeah. All right, well. A group of stern, pilgrimy looking men walk through an old timey Boston as credits roll. Red Fern watches as the men enter a huge, isolated tower. They walk up the long stairs to a cell, and inside is the Warlock, who is very bound up. And throughout this, he's only known as Warlock or the Warlock. We, yes, never, no we never hear his name. Of, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like got his hands and feet. Actually, his thumbs and big toes are chained together. Mm hmm. Don't let and some t- other and some other chains too. Yeah, he, he's yeah. very tied up. Yeah, they say he's going to be hanged and then burned over a basket of living cats. They want to make sure, I guess. It's not very fair to the <laughs> cats, though. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, the priests leave, but Redfern waits behind to talk. Redfern is the one who captured the evil magician. As he leaves, evil magical storm clouds arrive, and he runs back upstairs just in time to see the warlock has gotten free somehow. Well, the warlock vanishes, and Redfern jumps into the vortex after him. In the modern day, the vortex appears, well, 1992 anyway, Uh the vortex appears in Cassandra's living room. Her roommate, Chaz, tries to call the police, but the lines are down. His name is Chaz. He must be doomed. (laughs) <laughs> Ever seen anybody Chaz in a movie that actually survives? That, that survives? Not very many. <laughs> Since the man on the floor is unconscious, they carry him to a bed. We see that Cassandra is diabetic and takes insulin. And this has nothing to do with the plot whatsoever, but you know it's going to mean something eventually. Yep, those are uh, Chekhov's needles. <laughs> <laughs> Warlock is shocked that he's been gone for three centuries. But when he passes out again, she leaves for work. Warlock likes Chaz's ring, which has something to do with astrology, so he cuts the finger off to get it. Then he bites Chaz's tongue out. Mm. Did that ring have anything to do with anything? He just wanted it. Okay, yeah, I thought so. He liked it. That pretty, that mine. (laughs) Gimme. Well, the police talk to Cassandra, and they think Chaz's murder was a gay thing. Some kind of gay attack. She denies that because he wasn't all queer about it. Yeah, that was it's a funny. 90s I movie. Thought, yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> There's a difference, I guess. And, you know, more of a difference back then that you could talk about. Well, the warlock <laughs> goes to see the channeler, a spiritualist. Warlock wants her to channel his father, whose name is Zamiel. She puts on a spiritualist act, but he's not fooled. Then the real Zamiel takes over her body. And her face changes and she gets all ugly. Yeah, then it's obvious that it's the real thing. Yeah, <laughs> she's not faking that. Zamiel wants Warlock to bring together my Bible, a book that can thwart creation itself. There are three parts of the book. He cut, then cuts out the seer's eyes, which will lead him to the parts of the book. Cassandra goes home to pack up her stuff and finds Redfern there. 
He's very intense and terrifies Cassandra. He's weirder than the warlock was. A little bit, yeah. He gets a bit of warlock's blood from the broken window and does a tracking spell of his own. And he uses a thing called a witch compass, which points in the right direction. The police arrive, and he sees cars for the first time. Then they use a taser on him and take him away. This is something that I missed out of the second movie. Mm -hmm. Both the Warlock and Red Fern are fish out of water, out of time. What the heck is that thing with wheels and flashing lights? Yeah. Uh What is this place I'm in? Yeah. The second movie, not one comment. Warlock. He was used to it by then. Oh, he was. He was only around (laughs) for a few days. Well, Cassandra goes back inside and the Warlock returns. He tears apart the antique dining room table and finds pages from the book inside. That is mighty coincidental. Mm-hmm. He then knocks... Well, I think he was drawn to that spot. Okay, yeah. By the vortex. Yeah. He knocks Cassandra out and then says some magic words over her. When she wakes up the next morning, her hair is really long and gray. She's aged 20 years overnight. She's well, been cursed. Yes. Cassandra bails out Redfern, and he gets to do the whole fish-out-of-water thing in the new time period. He says she needs to get her charm bracelet back from the warlock to break the spell he cast. Otherwise, she'll age another 20 years by tomorrow, and it's not going to stop. That could be a problem in a few days. Yeah, it could. You're going to run out of that. Warlock runs into a little boy who brags about never going to church. Warlock tells him he's a witch, and the boy laughs. Yeah, who's laughing now? (laughs) (laughs) Red Fern and Cassandra drive through the desert using the witch compass. The man at the gas station says a boy was just killed nearby, and they think it was a coyote. It was not a coyote. It was not. Redfern says that the unbaptized human child fat makes the best flying potions. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, the warlock can fly now. Yeah, he's really a bad guy. The flying effects are pretty decent. Yeah. He's not like Superman, but it's it's well done. Yeah, I thought so. Morning comes, and warlock has found the second part of the book in a Mennonite's barn. The old farmer complains that the milk has gone bad and the horses are sweaty. He recognizes the signs and paints a protective sigil on the house. Maybe a little too late, but he did it. Red Fern talks about his dead wife, who was killed by the warlock. Red Fern notices the painted barn and they stop. Red Fern and the Mennonite man track the warlock to the attic and nail him inside. Red Fern goes inside and the warlock is already gone, but he does find a page from the Devil's Bible. Now Redfern knows what the warlock is looking for. And he knows that he's not going to be far. He's going to be coming he's gonna back, come back for that he page. Wants, he wants his page. And he and does. sure enough, the two men fight. Warlock tries to fly away, but Redfern has him tied to a whip. The warlock has a crash landing, and they fight some more. They bind his thumbs and his toes again, but the Mennonite man looks into Warlock's eyes, and his eyes start to bleed. Don't do that. No. He was warned. He was warned. He was yes. warned. Yeah. Cassandra gets her bracelet back, bracelet back, and she's instantly young again. She got what she wants, so she doesn't want to help anymore. Redfern warns that if Warlock gets the whole book, it'll be the end of the world. Ooh. Cassandra does some research, and they think that they can find the third part of the book before the Warlock does. They need to fly to Boston, and Redfern is not thrilled by the whole concept of airplanes. It doesn't matter since the warlock is right behind them at the airport. Cassandra doesn't tell Redfern that she saw him. Might have been useful information, but what could they have done? No. He didn't she's, have a ticket. She's, well, she saw him and then he disappeared. And yeah. like, you know, she told Redfern, like, well, okay, what are we going to do then? Yeah. Well, they board the airplane anyway, but Redfern notices that there are signs of witchcraft on the plane. They search but can't find him. We see that he's in the cargo hold. Oops. Everyone arrives in Boston. Redfern and Cassandra arrive at an old church, and the priest lets them inside. As they talk, the warlock arrives. The priest has records about the grand grimoire, and he says the third part is buried in a local grave. They arrive at the church, and the hollowed ground smokes when Redfern touches warlock's blood to it. It's a perfectly safe place. It's hollowed ground. Yeah. He can't get the book. Turns out, except the book is in Giles Redfern's tomb. That's pretty shocking for Redfern, since it's his own dead corpse inside. Cassandra sees a sign talking about grave relocation, and they're going to move the graves fairly soon, so it's not going to be safe for long. Well, and they already had moved some of them. Yeah. Yeah, so, so half of the grave 
sites were not consecrated already. Well, Redfern's grave was still good, mm -hmm. but yeah. it wouldn't be for long, so they had to take care of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, they open Redfern's tomb, and Redfern can't look at himself. Cassandra takes the pages of the book from his cold, dead hands, and they each take half the pages. Warlock grabs Cassandra and uses her as a hostage until Redfern gives him the rest of the book. Redfern challenges Warlock to fight one-on-one. -on -one. They fight without magic, and Warlock gets the upper hand. Warlock throws Cassandra into the bay, and she notices that it's salt water. And we've been told several times that Warlocks don't like salt. They can't abide salt. And she pulls out her insulin her syringes. syringes. It's syringe time. Now, here's the thing. I, mm -hmm. How many diabetics carry insulin and syringes in their pocket? Not many. It has to be refrigerated. The insulin itself does, and you'd have syringes with the insulin. I mean, you might. You, um, yeah, what would good with the What would good with the syringes do without insulin? No good. And you can't carry the. Yeah. Okay. Logic. She carries them. Yeah. Because why not? She does. You never know when you're in driving around and might need. Some. Might might be able to you know <laughs> use somebody else's. Insulin. Warlock does a spell, and the unholy book reassembles itself. As he gets ready to undo all of creation, Cassandra injects him with salt water. He burns up and the evil clouds dissipate. All better. She watches as Redfern also disappears into a vortex and vanishes back to his own tomb. She then picks up the evil book and buries it somewhere in the Bonneville Salt Flats, a huge desert of salt. Nope, not going to see that book again. No. All right, like seven, Kevin, like seven said, Kevin said, said. we never find, the war, find out the <clears throat> warlock's name. The special effects are good, but not excessive. The soundtrack is excellent, and the casting is awesome. Julian Sands and Richard E. Grant were neither one big names at this point, but they went on to do tons and tons of stuff. But this is probably the first thing I remember seeing either of them in. Laurie Singer has not done so much. Well, she has she done anything about... lately? Is oh, she still working? Oh, well, lately? I don't know. Is she alive? Oh, uh, she's still alive. Okay. Yeah. Her old age makeup is not bad for the time period. The flying effects on the farm are not so great. But later in the cemetery, the flying effects are really good. It's all obviously done with wires. This is pre-CGI times, but it was good. The pacing is fine. We get lots of explanations, and it never really gets talky. We both thought it held up very well. We were still entertained. We both recommend it still. She hasn't done a lot in recent years. Okay. Laurie Singer. TV or? Uh, uh, movie parts. Okay. Yeah, and there's, there's something coming out this year. Rachel Hendricks, and she is Rachel Hendricks. Yeah. But she's only got an IMDb of 28 entries. So okay. She, she hasn't done a ton of stuff. She did a lot of stuff around this time period. But yeah. and, and I was looking up Julian Sands. He was in at least a couple other horror movies. Um, there's, um, okay, what I lost track of which one it was. Monday, <laughs> The Ghosts of Monday. And uh, Gothic. Okay. And Rosamata the Werewolf. Ooh, the werewolf hunt. Okay, may have to look those up sometime. Not so well known though. Yeah, and arachnophobia, which yeah. is more of a comedy. okay. I remember that one. More sure. of a comedy, but yeah. All right. So he's yeah, a little other, a little horror stuff. Did we watch a short film this week? We did one called Flat, which was written and directed by Michael Skeins, stars Seth Castle, Julia Axe, and Carolyn Gottlieb. Gottlieb? Gottlieb. Gottlieb. Uh, Runtime's 10 minutes and 26 seconds, and it's for free on YouTube. Yep. What happens? It's a good one. I liked this one a lot. Well, we hear part of a news report about a young woman being murdered in her, ho in her hotel room. Her guy, Rick, comes to the door, and he's been injured. Well, we go back 15 hours to see what really happened. He's out driving through the desert, gets a flat tire. And he calls for service, but it will be a long time, so he waits. A woman comes to his car, pulls up behind him, makes fun of his inability to change a tire. They flirt intensively. Uh, you could be a serial killer for all I know, she says. And things devolve from there. You know, whenever somebody says that, run. Yeah. You could yeah. be a serial killer. <laughs> yeah, so could you. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, he couldn't be bothered to fix his own tire and when waiting for the service was going to be that long. But, you know, if you don't know how to, I guess. You know, but you know if you got three or four hours to wait in the maybe, desert, maybe I think I'd figure it out probably try, try to. to learn. Yeah. 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 He said he didn't know how, but, um, you know, make an effort anyway. I don't know. The acting, cinematography, and sound were all excellent. It's really good and didn't go where we expected, which is always a good thing. Yeah. yeah. And she said the serial killer comment, and you know where that's going to go. Yeah. But that's not where that goes. <laughs> more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, what happens after you watch Warlock? You watch Warlock 2, The Armageddon, which they made in 1993, with a different director, Anthony Kikix. Uh, written by Kevin Rock, Sam Bernard, and David Wohe again. Stars Julian Sands, he's back, yay! Chris Young, Paula Marshall, and Joanna Pakula. Runtime was an hour and 38 minutes, and there's a trailer in the show notes. And spoiler free, um, you know, despite what we were led to leave, believe in the first film, the warlock did not die. Wow. They often do that in movies. Julian Sands is back with all his charm, but nothing in the movie is quite as good this time. It's an okay sequel. It's not great in any way. It's not a bad movie. It's not bad. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, st- it's, still, it's still decent. If you like the first one, you should watch the second one. But it's not as good. It's not as good, right? Julian Sands really makes it, of course. And but, he's not as good either, honestly. But, well, they didn't give, his, give him as much to do, I don't think. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, we open on a lunar eclipse as credits roll. We are told that once every millennium, when the sun aligns with the moon, druids summon the magic of their sacred rune stones in the quest to prevent the birth of Satan's son. Sounds like a video game. Yeah, it does. We watch as a possessed-looking, very pregnant woman is surrounded by druids with magic stones. They stop the evil spell, but then they're all killed by men on horseback. The only surviving druid gets away with two of the stones. The final battle is still to be fought. Okay. I thought they missed a missed an opportunity there by not having Julian Sands in with the Raiders. Mm-hmm. You know, he was he was around at that time. Yeah, he could have been. But no. Yeah. This is just us, just some guys. In the present, lightning strikes a tree and a bunch of sawdust falls out. It's the sign of his birth. A woman looks at the eclipse and suddenly grows a big belly and gives painful birth to a slug. The slug then eats her little dog. It gets bigger and bigger and becomes the warlock. The possessed mother gives warlock six days to gather the other rune stones. Well, that was weird. Yeah. Kind of. Had to bring him back somehow, I guess. But again, he's on a quest. Got to find the pieces and assemble them. Three parts of the book. Or six rune stones. Six rune stones. Yeah. yeah. Kenny Travis plays chess with his father, Will, who we see as the man who recognized the sign in the sawdust. In the morning, Will goes to see Larson and Franks. He shows them the sign in the sawdust, too, and then the three do a ritual. They've made plans for the return of the warlock, but they're all old and weak now. They're the modern druids. Mm-hmm. Kenny and Samantha talk about college, and they spot Will and Franks walking through the field and freak out. Then Will shoots Kenny. Oh, okay. That was kind of unexpected. They sprinkle magic glitter on him and his wounds heal. All better. He's a druid now, too. Well, they had to make him the the warrior druid. And for for that to happen, he had to die and come back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they explain the plot. Yeah. In the city, there's a fashion show for Paula Dare. Warlock is in the audience and sees that she's wearing one of the stones. He takes her hand, and the two fly above the city. He's not Superman. She gives him the stone, and he drops her. He's a meanie head. Yeah. Well, Ted Ellison is the town preacher, and he used to be in Will's Druid group, but now he doubts all that stuff. Yeah. This makes no sense. (laughs) If you're in a Druid group, and you're doing real magic that you can see and And work and do... And you can see it's working... Like, literally, in front of you. Why would you doubt that and go over to, you know, become a regular preacher where they never see You don't see literally anything see anything happen. Yeah. I don't know. That was that was kind of strange. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. anyway. <laughs> to, go, to go from, you know, what's in front of you to just act, acting on faith. Yeah. Well, so, he, It seems like the opposite of logical. Yes. If you'd like to yeah. get into a religious argument with Kevin, his email... <laughs> <laughs> Well, he takes his daughter, Samantha, away from Kenny. Franks does a spell, and the warlock springs a leak. 
Will tells Kenny that he's going to be a great warrior. Will teaches about the power of the druids, which is essentially the Force. At about this point, I noticed that even the music cues are similar to Star Wars. It, it it's was like the Luke Skywalker way. theme. A little bit, yeah. Use the Force, Kenny. Yeah, and he's like, you know, telekineting things around. And remember the scene in Star Wars where he's fighting the ball with his lightsaber? Here it's a baseball. Yeah, <laughs> it's the same thing. Here's some similarities. Warlock shows up at a sideshow carnival and talks to the owner about a stone that decorates one of the exhibits. When the psychic dwarf tries to intervene, he makes <clears throat> short work of her. Mm. Things go poorly for the carnival manager, but Warlock gets his stone. We see that Ethan Larson, one of Will's druids, is following the warlock with his magic compass. Yeah, and he's got the magic knife that can kill the warlock. And yes, there is thinks, a magic knife. He thinks he's at least going to slow him down, and the others tried to say, no, you're too old and weak, and he's going to try it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Samantha complains to Kenny about her dreams. Kate complains to Ted about mad-mouthing the druids. Samantha shows Will her telekinetic powers and then confronts her own father. She wants to be reborn too, but Ted doesn't want to do it. So she stabs herself, and the other druids bring her back just like Kenny. She too is now a warrior. We see Ethan in an elevator with a warlock. And that scene I thought was really well done. Uh huh. It's kind of suspenseful. Where you don't you think you know the warlock doesn't realize he's there, and Ethan at first doesn't realize that that's the warlock, and the the little hunter uh, you know tracker thing in his pocket starts, bzz, bzz, yeah. bzz. <laughs> and then he realizes, oh crap, I'm in the elevator with the warlock, and then a couple of <laughs> just random people get in the elevator, and it's one yeah. of those awkward elevator scenes. Yeah, and then they get out, and then you think, oh, he's gonna stab him, he's gonna win, he's gonna kill the warlock. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, only the warlock leaves the elevator. He talks with a, with a collector of rare things and soon adds one more stone to his collection. The druid group gives Kenny the final two stones that they already have. Kenny and Samantha go to their local version of Stonehenge to await the warlock. This is all in the United States. This is not British. They don't have a Stonehenge here. No, oh, it's a, you know American version. Okay, <laughs> yeah, a little rock hinge. Yeah. The the school bully Andy shows up for Samantha, but Kenny is not into being bullied anymore. You never saw Luke Skywalker use the Force against a bully, did you? No, we didn't. Well, Will and Ted go to town, and everyone is assembled there. They have Kate crucified upside down in the churchyard. Everyone blames Will for being a Satanist. Yeah, these druids are not popular in town because everybody thinks they're devil worshippers because druids. Mm -hmm. Well, and the warlock did that to Kate. The, the oh, yeah, yeah. Didn't. yeah. Warlock has captured Franks and demands the stones. Kenny attacks Warlock and gets impaled. Kenny then sets Warlock on fire. Will and Ted come in with shotguns, but Warlock doesn't need a gun to take both of them out. Well, Warlock then corners Samantha in the woods, and even the trees fight against him. Because druids. Mm -hmm. He immobilizes her and takes the final stone. The eclipse begins. Warlock makes the stones fly around, but is struck by Kenny's lightning bolt. He's got force lightning. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah, he does. There's another brief fight. Warlock opens up a portal to hell, and Satan's son starts to crawl out. Kenny and Samantha, both tied up, use their force powers to turn on the truck's high beam lights, which disrupts everything. That was easy. <laughs> that was way too easy. They flipped a but, switch in the truck. But they said ahead of time, the, the, the older guys said that... They know, need darkness. Uh, bright, yeah, it needs darkness to complete the... And, you know, any bright light could disrupt the ceremony. Seriously? And, and the tr truck just happened to be left there, just at the, you know, aim at, aimed at the right spot. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah, it was a little cheap. Well, then the sun comes out, and Kenny and the warlock have one last battle of wills over the blessed knife. He melts in front of both of them. Before they can collect all the stones, warlock's bony hand reaches out and grabs one of them. One of the stones. Yeah. So, in the end, Satan and the warlock were, defeaten, were defeated by a pickup truck's headlights. Sometimes it's that easy, I guess. I wasn't totally convinced <laughs> with the saltwater thing in the previous movie. This is just lame. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, in the first film, Warlock was pitted against Red Fern for someone from his own time who knew his history and was basically his mental equal. Yeah, and Red Fern had some good magic on his side, too. Yeah. You know, 
it was entertaining. The battle of equals. They knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. In this one, he's up against some clueless teenagers <laughs> and loses. Without well, well, they had magic too. They had, they were they had good magic. <laughs> okay, you're giving me that look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Without anyone intelligent to banter with. He's less interesting and becomes just a generic monster movie villain. Yeah, more so in this one. He was witty and funny and charming in the first one. In this one, he's just out Le to collect his so. rocks. Yeah, yeah. The special effects are more sparse than the previous film. Neither of the teenage actors can act at all. You've never seen them in anything since, I don't think. <laughs> okay. And all their scenes together just seem like bad soap opera. He's harsh. Oh, Will, we're going to college in the fall. What shall we do? Oh, Samantha, I will stay with you forever and ever. Brian is, is exaggerating. It wasn't, Not that, by it much. wasn't that bad. Not by much. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> All the fighting is basically just them using telekinesis against each other, and the stakes don't seem anywhere near as interesting as in the previous film. It was fine, but it was a pale comparison <laughs> to the original. Yeah, it was fine. Just don't turn the headlights on. And I'm told that the third one uh, has... Warlock again, but it's a different Warlock. It's a different character. So Julian Sands doesn't recur, doesn't reprise the role, but it's not the same guy. It's a different Warlock. It's a different Warlock, I'm told. Yeah. 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 We I'm, didn't review and I'm that also, one. And I'm also told it's very mediocre, yeah, from, from what I hear. We haven't seen it. So the no. two Warlock movies, and some say and there was a third. There's a third one, yeah. yeah. But there was a little girl who lives down the lane from 1976, which was... Directed by Nicholas Gessner, written by Laird Koenig, stars Jodie Foster in her first big role for her first starring movie She'd done role. TV and stuff, mm -hmm. but this is her first and feature film. Things, yeah. Also Martin Sheen, Alexis Smith, and Mort Schumann. Uh, run time's only an hour and 31 minutes, and there's a trailer in the show notes. I had not seen this before. I, I know that I've I, heard of it many I, times. I had seen it before, yeah. Um, and actually, this was... Uh, one that was super rare on VHS for a while. And I had managed to pick up a VHS copy and hit the timing just right. You know, VHS now isn't what it used to be, but yeah, it was a VHS copy. It wasn't available on DVD or, you know, mm -hmm. had been, and yeah, sold it for a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but spoiler free, this is a suspense drama with some horror elements. We don't know what's going on at first, and then we don't know how things are going to end up. The performances are really good, and the story is very interesting. It's a good one. Well, we've seen from the very first scene that there's a little girl who lives alone, and there's a pedophile in town. And you think... You that, know how it's going to go. Yeah, you think she's going to get attacked, and yeah, it's going to be maybe a revenge thriller thing Yeah, after she maybe gets attacked or something like that, that. But there's more to it than that, yeah. Rin Jacobs puts candles on a cake and wishes herself happy birthday in the mirror. Frank Hallett comes to the door, and he says it's Halloween, and she should be out trick-or-treating. That's Martin Sheen, and boy, is he creepy in this one. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He says he's a friend of her father, and he comes right in. She's just moved here from England, so, she, so he explains about trick-or-treating. He's clearly creepy and asking about her parents, but she offers him some cake. She's very polite, but doesn't say much. She's just about to turn 14, and he's... Very friendly, yeah. asking many questions. You're a very pretty girl, you know that? Pretty eyes, pretty hair. No boyfriend? Ew. Yeah, he's icky. Eventually, his t his own two children arrive, and he leaves with them. They're very small. Why was yeah. he so far ahead of his own kids? Because he's weird and He pervy. scoped her out, mm. probably. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, the next day, Rin finds Frank waiting to give her a ride to school, but she ignores him and walks on. Rin goes to the bank and cashes in a traveler's check from her locked deposit box, pointing out that her father has an account there. And she has to be kind of an insistent, because they're all like, oh, she's only a teenager. You know, she, but she gets what she needs. Yep, she does get some cash. Later, Cora Hallett, Frank's mother, stops by and she's grouchy. They rent the house from her, and she disapproves of Rin's father's poet lifestyle. Yeah, a poet. Oh, a bohemian. Yeah. Yes. But she takes his money. <laughs> yeah. She wonders why they don't see much of the Jacobs in town at the market. It's clear that both of the Hallets are really nosy about Wren's father. Cora says she's come for some jelly glasses in the cellar, but Wren doesn't want her there. Cora leaves in a huff and says she'll report Wren to the school board about not being in school. Where is Wren's father anyway? 
Well, Rin goes to the town hall and asks about the school board rules and meetings, and she finds out that Cora was lying about the school board meeting. Officer Ron Migliator Migliariti gives her a ride home, and they talk about the Hallets. And he's a genuinely good guy. Yeah, he's nice, but he does want to talk to Rin's father, who isn't home. She buys a couple of raffle tickets for a turkey from him, and he warns her about Frank. Everybody in town knows about Frank, but yeah. his mother's rich, so what can you do? Mm -hmm. Cora comes over again and threatens Rin, saying she's going to throw them out. But Rin isn't going to play her game. Cora doesn't believe Rin's father is there, and Rin threatens to tell her father about Cora's son. Cora insists on going into the cellar for those jelly glasses anyway, and when she gets down there, she screams. What did she see? Huh. Well, she hits her head on the door on the way back up, and then she's quiet. Yep, she's dead. And it's one of those cellars where it's a trap door on the floor. And Which the, falls on her yeah, head. Yeah, the door and, falls yeah. on her head. It's and a complete, it's an accident. It is an accident. Yeah, Rin didn't do it on purpose. But it, she but did. But conveniently, she's dead. Problem solved, sort of. <laughs> Rin gets Cora car, Cora's car keys from the body, but she doesn't know how to start the car. Mario, a teenager dressed like a magician for some oddball reason. Because he's a magician. He's weird. He's on his way to a, do a kid's show. He's got a gig. Stop, he stops and offers to help. He knows whose car it is because there's only one Rolls Royce in town. She makes him dinner after he helps with the car. He gives her points on disposing of the car and the keys. He kind of knows what happens, sort of. Mm -hmm. Turns out Officer Ron is Mario's uncle, and he stops over while searching for Cora. Rin shows him that the jelly glasses are still there, waiting for Cora to come and pick them up. Yeah, I don't know. Never saw her. She didn't show up. Yeah. Soon after, Frank forces his way inside, and he demands to know where Rin's father is. And then he burns up Rin's hamster with a cigarette before throwing it into the fire. Oh, he's doomed. Yeah. Well, he's obnoxious and bossy and argues with both the kids. Mario and eventually runs him off with a sword. Because magician. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, Rin takes Mario down into the cellar and shows him Cora's and her mother's bodies. That's what Cora saw. Huh. She explains that her father was dying from an illness. He knew he was dying, so he set up everything for her to survive on her own without him before walking out into the ocean and disappearing. When her estranged mother showed up, Rin poisoned her tea. And even then, Rin wasn't deliberately knowing that she was going to murder her. Her father left her this stuff and said, you know, if your mother shows up, Put some of this in her tea, it'll calm her down. You know, we know what she's like. She's going to be all, you know, in your face and everything. Put some of this in her tea, it'll calm her down is all that he told her in. And then after the fact, Ren realized, oh, that was cyanide. <laughs> yeah, up to this, this point, we had assumed the father's body was in the basement. Uh -huh. No, it's more to it than that. Yeah. The next day, Mario helps Ren bury the bodies in the yard. It rains and he gets the shivers, so she gives him a hot bath and father's pajamas. She cuddles up with him to help him get warm. Officer Ron comes by and admits that he doesn't believe Rin's story about her father. She says that poets are flaky and Dad's possibly an addict, but he's real and he's upstairs. She calls her father, who then comes downstairs and offers to sign one of the books for the officer. Ron believes it all, but we realize that it's just Mario in a disguise. And that's not too bad it's of a, a disguise. a good disguise. Yeah, it's pretty good makeup. Yeah. Rin then goes upstairs and has sex with Mario. Oh, my. Yes, 14-year-old Jodie Foster has a nude sex scene. But it's not sort really of. her. Yeah. Yeah. There was a body double. But but nobody knew that. She was so embarrassed for years and years. <laughs> because, and years everybody because everybody thought, thought it was did. her. Yeah. Yeah. Officer Ron comes by. Well, that's the official story, maybe. Yeah. 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 Official Officer Ron comes that's the by. Problem. You know, I mean, that's the problem in movies. You know, you, if you, know, you look naked and everybody thinks you're naked, they're going to, you know. It wasn't me. But it wasn't me. Well, yeah. okay, I might as well have been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Officer Ron comes by a few days later and tells her that Mario is in the hospital of pneumonia. He's delirious and talking out loud about Rin. Yeah, because it was rainy and wet when they, cold when they disposed of the bodies. They buried the bodies. What is he saying in his sleep? Yeah. That's... She goes to the hospital, but he's unconscious the whole time. Rin goes back home afterwards, and we see that Frank is hiding inside the house waiting for her, dressed like a magician to make the neighbors think he's Mario. He's found a little bit of evidence in the cellar, so he thinks he knows everything. Yeah, what was it? One of, his, one of her mother's 
Fingernails? Fingernails. Earring or something? I think it was her mother's earring and and Rin's mother's fingernail, maybe. Okay. It was a, it was an earring and a fingernail, I think. Probably but, not enough to really prove anything. But enough to make him... He's already suspicious, and that makes him really suspicious. Yeah. She offers to make him some tea. And we mm. know where it's going from there. Yummy. Ron calls on the phone to tell Rin that she won the turkey raffle. She doesn't let on that Frank is there with her. He offers to keep her secret if he can come around regularly and be friends with her. Ew. They eat cookies awkwardly and they drink their tea. He takes her teacup just in case, so he switches cups with her. You know, I know that you know that uh-huh. I know. It was one of those things. Well, she, she drinks it right that. down, so he follows suit. Then he starts to cough and looks a little sick. Yeah, yes, yeah, she did. Yep, she did. Well, people in this town have never heard of knocking at the door, and they never lock their doors either. People are always just walking in. Well, Rin doesn't, yeah. Yeah, weird place. Well, it starts going one way, but then it goes in a different direction very quickly. I was expecting her to be kidnapped and raped by Frank after that first scene. That's not how it went. Mm -mm. This was Jodie Foster's first starring role in a feature film, although she'd done a ton of supporting roles in TV work before this. She was very young doing stuff. Yeah, like four or five, I guess. She was really only 13 at the time of this film. And even though she had a body double for the nude scenes, she was always embarrassed by the film because people thought that was really her. Even so, the, the not much of a scene, really. No, it was quick. Martin Sheen is a super creeper here. I'm kind of surprised he ever got any good guy roles after this. <laughs> he can play both. He was good at this. <laughs> yeah. The burning of the hamster was actually real. But according to the director, the hamster was already dead and procured from an animal research facility for use in the film. Ew. I'm skeptical that they would go to that kind of trouble. Mm, maybe. Animal welfare. I don't know what the animal <clears throat> welfare rules were in the 70s. About a hamster? Now they now they wouldn't be able to get away with really killing a hamster on the on screen. You, know, for, to, you to don't think that the... animal wrangler could have just killed the hamster first and told the director, oh, look, it's already oh, dead. Oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We don't know for sure. Yeah. Hamster abuse. But anyway, that's the story. Yeah. And that takes us, that's all for this week. We've got over on HorrorBulletin.com, you can read about The Devil Bat from 1940 with Bella Lugosi. Which, you know, we talk about is, you know, it, it's dated, it's not great, but yet it's still fun. I like <laughs> it. It's a yeah. fun one. Yeah. And Bella Lugosi is clearly having fun in it. I thought he, I, I really got that impression. Yeah, the more you read about Bella Lugosi's life, the, the weirder it gets. Uh-huh. He did not end well for being such a big star. Yeah. Okay, and then we also watched Time Crimes, which we also talked about a little bit. It's a time loop, time paradox, time travel murder yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah, it's, we both liked it, too. Mm-hmm. Very good. All right, so check out HorrorBulletin.com if you want to sign up for a weekly email list and get all the reviews in your email bo- email box. Go to HorrorGuysShop.com if you want to pick up one of our books. We mentioned the Horror Bulletin Monthly earlier, but we've got books on Peter Cushing and Vincent Price, Roger Corman, Shock Theater, Son of Shock, Silent Films, and Hammer Films. So also, many books. Yeah. Buy them all. Buy them. Yeah, you could. <laughs> yeah. You could. You could. You could. Uh, or just go to the regular old site at horrorguys.com. And we'll have more movies for you next week. We sure Same will. as before. Same yeah. as always. Yeah. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. See you next week. See ya. <laughs>